right. Welcome to the Provoke and Inspire podcast. It's just lonely me. I'm going to do this all by myself today. No, 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 JK. With me, as always, is Luke Greenwood. What's up, Luke? Hello. Hello, Ben. I'm so happy to be here with you. We have you and Dave, I on we this have David podcast. Pierce. What's up? I don't know. When I see Luke, I was getting old. He was... Never mind. Never mind. All right. And Chad, as always, what's up, fellas? Why is everyone so silent when I initially introduced you? <laughs> you told us to be silent. Yeah, yeah. You said be quiet, guys. Uh, Greetings, it's, brothers and sisters. It's because of the internet lag. It's because I'll be like, what's up, guys? Here we are in lockdown reality. And then I'll wait. And then everyone will start trying to talk all at once. And it's just a conundrum. And I don't like it. Dude, uh, your new, this is. Can we talk your, about your new background? Because your new background is so dope. Look, shout out to Etsy. Uh, shout and, out and, to your new background. I'm what forgetting. Is, that? is it? Gold? It's an acrylic sign that this was. It was handmade for me by a guy. I'm forgetting his name. I will shout out to him. That's a weird way of saying that uh, on the next episode. But yes, this provoke and inspire sign is dope. I feel like I'm looking better than ever. Very sleek. I got my sort of monochromatic outfit going on here. Yep. Uh, but anyway, mm -hmm. this is the provoke and inspire podcast, calling followers of Jesus to radical faith outside of the church. We have an amazing show for you. We have Josh Porter, uh, formerly of Showbread, currently the. Uh, uh, pastor of teaching and creative vision at Van City Church in Vancouver. Oh. You know what? We had this big controversy where we were like, we shouldn't make our guests wait. It's awkward. It's uncomfortable. You know what, Josh? I'm going to bring you on. I see that you're here. Nice. I feel like George, you can you. handle our banter. So without any yeah. further delay, Josh Porter, welcome to the podcast. Oh, thanks for having me. What What's the guest usually doing during this time? <laughs> we usually put him in isolation. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Drinking Look, tea. Look, we have this we have this thing. We're trying to be really cool and legit, you know, where we have like a, an opener and then and then we sort of have a transition and bring on the guests. And we, we just had a big argument before this podcast started because it's like, <laughs> is this just uncomfortable or what? And and so, yes, ultimately, on the in the spur of the moment, I decided it is. But uh, welcome to the podcast. Nonetheless, how are you doing, man? Oh, thanks for having me. So I'm a, I'm an experiment in changing things up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, well, we know that you're 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 from the punk scene and we figured you'd like that, you know, anti-establishment kind of stuff. <laughs> I'm going well, I, think that, I just feel like a lot of weight is resting on my shoulders. If my early introduction goes poorly, the next well, poor person is going to be waiting in the wings. That's true. <laughs> that's yeah. true. I hope you do good. Yeah, yeah. Well, anyway, <laughs> so well, you and me both. Look, I think this is going to be just fine. So far, I think it's smooth sailing. So, hey, you know, we like to just kind of ease into these things. So so tell us, how is life? How are you doing? How are you guys handling this uh, unique uh, reality that we're all living in right now? The, oh, this is a question for me. Right? It is. It yeah. is. Okay. I didn't want to overstep. No, no. It's all about you right now, man. Um, Well, I don't want to be a simplistic, but I, I am doing quite well. I feel pretty privileged in that way. Um, I am I have the same gripes as everyone else, or I suppose most people in the low-level sense. I have been inconvenienced in a lot of uh, minor ways, a few major ways. But for the most part, um, my family and I have been hanging out in our house a whole lot mm. and uh, enjoying one another's company uh, and finding ways to stay not only entertained but to um you know share a kind of take advantage of the time that we have and you know making an occasion for intimacy and fun yeah. which sounds like a i'm uh trying to put i'm actually very pessimistic by nature uh, it sounds like i'm trying to put a, a uh, overly uh, optimistic spin on things but i realized a few days ago actually that i was like for for us things have been relatively comfortable and and pretty easy i realize that that's not the case for a great many people so i in that way yeah. i feel pretty grateful yeah no i i hear you i feel the same way and i i don't know even even as i as i sort of wrestle with the more peripheral consequences of this like it like you said i i find myself very sheepish and trying to complain because my family's healthy you know maybe some entertainment options have been reduced right but how can we possibly complain uh when when truly the very difficult reality that some of the people out there are facing is so much greater than 
the fact that I can't go to a movie or maybe I my, my uh, options for seeing people have been reduced. So I totally hear you. How are things going with your church? How, how are you guys uh, handling this transition? I, I see, you know, just uh, yesterday was Sunday and you see all of the online church services. And to be honest, my heart kind of goes out to a lot of these these pastors who I'd imagine it's a struggle. I mean, you put all this your heart and soul into this and and you don't want it to be all about streaming numbers any more than you want it to be about seats, people in the seats. Um, but it's got to be tough when when so much of your heart and soul goes into this and then all of a sudden you can't even physically be together anymore. Yeah, it's not fun. I I don't enjoy personally online church at all. I don't. I, yeah, that's <laughs> dude, that's two of us. I've <laughs> I pretty don't. much stopped going to online church to be completely transparent on here. Oh Sorry. well, don't don't Sorry, tell church. people in my church that I want them to actually show up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> all right. yeah. All right. <laughs> I won't um, tell them. Yeah, it's I if I'm being completely honest, and this sounds like a, um, a a dramatic way of saying things, but if someone had given offered me a job description for for what I'm doing at the moment, I would have readily declined in an instant. Uh, <laughs> It feels a lot like planting a new church all over again, and the kind of church that we're planting is not a church I would have ever wanted to plant. I don't, frankly, I don't believe in the kind of thing that we're doing. I, I embrace it as a necessity for the time being, and and uh, the, the folks in our church, we have a small little community, and they've been um, tremendously resilient and fantastically encouraging. Uh, so no one's pitching a fit. No one's complaining. Everyone acknowledges that this is not only not the ideal, it's just not the way that church is done. But they're also acknowledging yeah. that at the, the time being, this seems like the best thing that we can possibly do. Right. Uh, so we're we're making the best of it. And I think that I'm trying to be inspired by the folks in our community who are uh, wonderfully resilient and who are um doing their best to be encouraging and remember that that's it, everyone knows or i don't mean to sound like a butthead but it, everyone acknowledges that it feels dumb it feels dumb to have church on a zoom call um it right. feels like you're you're putting so much work into maintaining some sense of intimacy and at the end of the day it's not really intimacy at all but we're embracing it for the time being because it's what we have so yeah. with that mm. said it's like both things in 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 each hand you know one of so our Josh, good, one of our good friends and um, missionaries Whoa. from Brazil says send your uh, your book along to Brazil. So I don't know if that could ever happen, but uh, just thought I'd throw that out there. The joke that we play <laughs> on the world in Brazil to Brazil. So I have a question, Josh. Uh, what have you feel like you you've learned anything from this pandemic in in terms of your your view of the world, your relationship with God, what's important, what's not important? Yeah, I, I feel. As if, I'm sure most people would say that there's been all kinds of um, educational moments throughout. It, it seems like such an unprecedented thing. And if you look backward, you know, through history, there's comparable times in history. But this one, in a lot of ways, feels it seems like what, what I'm reading from people who know more than I do. It seems in many ways unprecedented, but it, it's bringing to the surface all kinds of deficiencies in human character that are all always there on the and and frankly uh, you know often on the surface but they're now uh kind of mutating into these strong aggressive caricatures when you see uh I, it feels to me like the narrative that we're being pitched is an extreme dichotomy you're you're either you know a a backwards anti-science flat earther um hmm. if you if you by this narrative or you're you know you're some kind of um you know left leaning uh whatever the character caricature on the other side would be as if these are the only two positions right. you can possibly maintain and um it's brought you know out of the woodwork all kind of uh debates around science and ethics and you you see the <laughs> as here's my pessimism you see the worst in people quite frankly and um I think that there's a, a a tendency to reach for some kind of uh, you know uh, through line that's like here's the greater purpose and all this or the greater me and my personal theology of you know, uh, providence and how the problem of evil and how things 
Vikings work uh, has a, a, a big shelf for chaos and evil. So it, it seems to me like it's not that unprecedented in the sense that the world is screwed up and broken things happen all the time, but it is unprecedented in the sense of the specifics. Right. So it's the same old conversations, but they're swirling around this new thing that's hmm. never happened before. And people have lots of the same old questions, but they're applying it to this new thing that's never happened before. So in a lot of ways, it feels like the same old conversations, but around right. this new thing, hyper, um, you know, juxtaposition between the right and the left, sociopolitical vitriol, the problem of evil. These are conversations that never really go away, but they've been aggravated to such right. a degree because of current circumstances. Hmm. Josh, do you engage a lot in, in this, like this, that discussion? Because, um, you know, I've, uh, by the way, Luke here from Poland and I've, uh, followed showbread from, uh, some of the early days, really enjoyed showbread a lot. And, uh, anyway, there was like, I know that there's been a shift in your life and now working more with, with the church, um, showbread, you guys were engaged a lot in, in the audience outside the church. What's that like for you now? Do you still get to engage in those conversations? Do you still have kind of, I don't know, evangelistic type opportunities or just engaging with non-Christians outside the church? I do, but I have uh, decidedly fewer of those interactions, which in the early days of my, um, I don't want to call it a career transition, but my focus on my vocation, um, as you said, when, I, when it was showbread, I was um, almost every single night, certainly most nights out of the year, Hmm. was I was regularly having conversations with people who did or did not follow Jesus or did or did not have any presumptions about Jesus or the Bible or Christianity. And um, I was engaging with those kinds of ideas with people from different types of the Christian tradition or people who are far outside of it, interested or hostile to it almost every single night. And now my vocation has brought me into a place where the conversation I'm having is mostly directed to people who follow Jesus or who are mm -hmm. new to following Jesus, have been following Jesus for a long time, but they're somewhere in that spectrum. And in the beginning, that was a, a, a struggle. I think I, I felt as if I had done something terribly wrong, that my vocation had put me in a position where I was having way more conversations with people who um, already knew and followed Jesus than those who didn't. Now my conversations are less like traveling around meeting new people every single night and they're more like i've over the last year i've gotten to know the guy who lives across the street from me that kind of thing mm -hmm. the, my barista at the local coffee shop that kind of thing um but you know i it seems to me that this is there was a time and a place where um, i was set in a certain vocation for a certain reason and now i've been moved to another one. So my conversations back in the showbread days were much more about approaching the idea of following Jesus, the teachings of Jesus. What does it look like mm -hmm. for someone to be brought into that evangelistic, to use your word? And now they're more like, um, what does it mean? What their conversations around discipleship? What does it mean to follow Jesus well? Hmm. What does it mean to apply the teachings of Jesus to be formed spiritually? And I think we need people for both conversations. And, mm. and, you know, I, ideally I want to exist in both worlds and both conversations, but it seems like, you know, my vocation has put me in one at one point and in, in another, and I don't know what it'll be next. Yeah. Along those lines, I mean, I think that's really interesting that you've kind of lived, you know, not these two lives, but you've had these very distinct vocations and now you've kind of seen both sides. And, and I think you, you have that perception a little bit of, um, evangelistic efforts that they can be kind of um, front heavy in the sense of this is maybe who Jesus is and this is what you need to, need to do to give your life to him. But then it can be a little bit too shallow in the sense of then how do you become that apprentice of Jesus? How do you really live your daily life modeling who he is? And there seems to be a, you know, this very large, thin uh, following of Jesus, but not a lot of depth. And so um, I, I would argue that we, on both sides of that, re regardless of what side of the vocation we fall on, we should be striving for ultimately that common objective, which is lifelong, deep, you know, following Jesus every day. Um, how on how do we maintain that balance? How 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 do those with a discipleship calling not forget to still be introducing new people and and you know really looking out for the people in their lives that have no concept of Jesus. And then at the same time, how do those that do that all the time not forget that they got to go deep? 
do, do, do you can get, have any thoughts in terms of making sure we're really pushing both both things forward? Yeah, that was the journey of my church, the church and the church that planted my church was that um, a few years ago, we realized that there was kind of a shared deep seated conviction that we had blown it as a church in terms of uh, mission, which I realize is uh, kind of a, a cliche or overused word. We had not um, shown a spiritual responsibility for the city in which we had lived. We had not demonstrated a concern for the gospel, you know, sharing the actual miss- mission and story of Jesus. And so we went all in on trying to turn that church around. It was, it was like trying to turn an enormous ship and teach uh, disciples of Jesus what it means to be missional, what it means to share the gospel, what it means to actually demonstrate concern for the people who are in your purview, like your your community, people in, that you see when you visit local businesses, caring for the poor, doing justice work in the city and around the world, all that kind of stuff. And it was mostly great, but one thing that we realized several years into that journey is that um, it's very difficult to teach uh, disciples of Jesus to be missional when they have not been formed spiritually, when they have not experienced a hmm. level of spiritual formation that they yeah. understand why it is that they would care about the right. people yeah. in their community. And that thing doesn't kind of click on from the moment they come to faith or for the moment they hear the story. Um, for some people, it does. Some people have a natural wiring that demonstrates a tremendous concern for people around them. And that's who they are. But but most disciples of Jesus um, have to grow and train in the way of Jesus and be formed in the way of Jesus so that they learn what it means to be missional. And so because of that experience and informed by a lot of writers like uh, Dallas Willard was huge in our mm. uh, transformation from going all in immediately on the missional thing and then realizing that uh, we had... <laughs> We had to kind of go backwards that the cart was a bit before the horse and teach people what it means to follow Jesus, to like actually train in the ways of Jesus. And Mm. that, you know, that Mm. Jesus used the language of practice, whoever practices and teaches these commands, um, these teachings. We realize that the way of Jesus takes practice, that Christ likeness is not natural, that you have to actually learn the teachings of Jesus, put them into practice and be formed over time. So we shifted and moved our entire church uh, shape, if you want to call it that, or form to be more on um, the practices of Jesus and and not negating mission a missional approach whatsoever. But we started with things like we're going to learn silence and solitude. We're going to learn fasting. We're going hmm. to learn prayer. We're going to yeah. actually um, go into the teachings of Jesus, bring these things into our communities or what we'd call like our small group format with curriculum and practices and actually learn them one at a time. And then eventually in that process, we got to um, sharing the gospel. We got to, you know, outreach in the community and things like that. Um, not because we think that those things are secondary in any way, but after a few years of learning what it means to fast, to practice silence and solitude, to sit in prayer, to practice the presence of God, um, to, and, and not just those things, but principles of emotional health, uh, health dealing with your past and hmm. confronting trauma, things like that, seeking out uh, mentorship, spiritual direction, therapy. And then we bring people into a conversation about what does it look like to have your neighbors over? What does it look like to talk to your barista about Jesus? And we found personally that that conversation went much better (laughs) after those years of practice than it did when we first tried to just go all in on, you know, turn on a dime. This is our focus now. We should be doing this. We've missed something. I still totally believe that we were missing something and that we do miss something when we you know, become insular and turn the focus away from mission. But I do think that um, it takes practice and training in the ways of Jesus to even bring people to a place where they understand why mission matters at all so that it doesn't become an exercise in duty, but like the natural outworking of of loving uh, concern for the gospel itself. Absolutely. I just finished uh, Renovation of the Heart by Dallas Willard and just, oh, just the, the appeal to the the practical living, the outworking of a following a life that follows Jesus is so appealing. And I, 
I feel like we're trying to give people what we don't have. And, and I think until that, that personal transformation and personal revival takes place, people can kind of see through the sales pitch. I, I, I agree. We need to not overcorrect, but our faith is just a balance of tensions. Um, sorry to, to ask another question here. I love this entire topic. And I, what have you found has been the biggest barrier to your people grabbing hold of this call to become, you know, these apprentices of Jesus to really become formed? What are, what are the things that are pulling in the other direction? What, what are the things you've had to, to fight against that have really been uniquely difficult, maybe in, in the area you're in, but maybe just the, the secular world in general? Um, I think trying early on to help our people understand that all spiritual formation is counter formation hmm. um, was coming up against the, the, the primary barrier, which is the formation that's being done to you, whether you want it to happen or not. The idea that um, Christian spiritual formation uh, or spiritual formation in general, rather, is not a uniquely Christian concept We're we're all being formed. We all follow certain masters and teachers. We all are religious in the sense that we have a worldview. We have a belief system in place that interprets the stories that we hear in the world around us. And you are being turned slowly into another person over time, whether you want that to happen or not. This is not unique to the spiritual or religious worldview. Yeah. And the stories that you're hearing come from a myriad of different sources. You have the culture surrounding us. And we li I live in the Pacific Northwest in the greater Portland metro area, which is a, a formation machine. You are being told what to think about a great many things, political, spiritual, personal, yeah. on an everyday basis. You're being you know, given stories from advertising. You're certainly be being given stories from the, you know, the news media and the political spheres. So you're, you're being formed whether you want to be formed or not, and you will not be formed into the likeness of Jesus by simply reading the scriptures and showing up to church. Those two things are crucial, and they're part of discipleship, but that will not make you more like Jesus over time, which is why Jesus' teachings are populated with a much more than simply belong to a community and read the scriptures. It's not less than that. But it's a lot more than that hmm. to do um, to be formed into the likeness of Jesus. You have to do counter formation. You have to go against yeah, the yeah. stories that you're being told. You have to go against the habits and practices that you've picked up over time that are either kind of innocuous and they're just what you do or the in your know, negative habits that you've learned over time and learn different habits instead, because habits shape the kind of person that you are. You you. Um, don't do spiritual disciplines because you're supposed to tick them off a box. You do spiritual disciplines because they turn you into a different person slowly over time. So I think that coming up against the barrier of like, why why do I need to do these extra things? They feel like things that are going to populate more of my time and my time is already precious. Why do I have to do, um, can't I just show up to church and read my Bible and be moderately decent morally and ha hmm. helping people understand like, we're all become, you know, even if you just look at the trajectory of your life 10 years ago, hopefully you're a different person than you are yeah. right now. And when people realize that, they're like, I guess I am changing and I'm changing because of things that I've come to believe over, over time or because I started doing this thing, whether it's a, a good thing, like I started jogging or a bad thing, like I picked up this negative habit and it's turned me into this different person. Helping people understand that formation is inevitable and that counter formation is crucial in discipleship was, I think, the big first step. In our journey i like yeah, i like a lot josh cool. how you're talking about um the process of transformation and the process of being formed re regardless of whether it's where you know like no no i'm not being changed at all and it, it's like well whether you want to be or not you are being changed and you know there was a time in our lives where um uh, life life just seemed so i don't know maybe maybe um unique or specific to a moment and i can you know i can recall thinking back on you specifically but your band more broadly and and i thought you know these guys are like the greatest oxymoron of artistic endeavors because you were like on one hand you were like you had grown up southern baptist uh you were like good southern boys and um you guys as far as i knew 
didn't swear in any of your songs or publicly. You you didn't consume alcohol. You didn't smoke marijuana. You didn't. Uh, there are all these kind of things that that would have been taboo then hopefully maybe in some ways still are taboo now that you didn't engage in. You did shoot me in physically shoot me with a BB gun (laughs) while whilst on tour. And you, you were the only band that tried to get me to watch evil dead two with you (laughs) while on tour. You're the only band that I actually knew of that really had an affinity for horror movies and I know I'm kind of like shifting gears a little bit on our discipleship conversation, but you and I had talked about this book that you're working on and the concept of uh, how we as Christians, if I'm understanding it correctly, the concept of how we as Christians understand or if stripped down offensive art. Um, specifically, if I'm not mistaken, the title of your book forthcoming is going to be with all its teeth, sex, violence, profanity, and the death of Christian art. Can, so can you just, I feel like I just threw up, but can you just make sense of all that and bring it, bring it into, into a, uh, a so Chad does best. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Chad, Chad I just throws up. verbally threw up. I'm sorry. That's the that next book Chad's writing. One of the things I do really yeah. well. <laughs> yeah that's after your risks book is yeah yeah, yeah. Throws up. how to yeah, Johnson story. how to throw up really well I, can, I actually think there's a bridge there between the discipleship conversation yeah. um, nice. thanks and i th- if for a, a lot of my the the book that i wrote uh came from years of experience and con- conversations with um folks that i felt personally and at this time i was um, uneducated and it was like a, it was not a formed um, opinion or philosophy but it seemed to me like uh, inside certainly inside the Christian music industry bubble and then in the kind of wider um, evangelical church bubble there seemed to be a pervasive low view of art and that's not that's uh, not um, just you know unsavory art or offensive art but just art in general it seemed like there was a prescribed way of doing art and creativity. And if you followed that guideline, then you had a place in the church and you had a voice artistically within certain limits, but you could do it as long as you did the cookie cutter thing. But if you deviated from that expectation, then um, it was questionable. It was unwelcome. It was suspicious. And uh, I had, you know, as I had grown up, Um, as a person who was interested in art and creativity, um, got into music, and the things that most inspired me to make art were not things that came from inside those bubbles at all. It was like uh, my dad playing Queen records for me when I was a kid, or um, it was, you know, a Steven Spielberg film that I saw when I was young. It was uh, the kind are reading a novel by Kafka when I was in you know fifth or sixth grade, and um, I did not see this gigantic chasm between like you know a secular way of doing art and a Christian way of doing art. I saw all art as potentially useful in the experience of the disciple to Jesus. It did not occur to me that like, oh, I'm not supposed to like Kafka because I'm a, I'm a Christian. I, it inspired me. It spoke to my, um, you know, discipleship to Jesus. It had a lot to say about God and the world. And of course, I'm digesting everything through the lens of my own worldview, which is informed by the scriptures and, dis- and discipleship to Jesus. And it, it seems strange to me that this was not a, a view that was shared by other people. Um, And then over time and after many years of processing and learning and all that and doing seminary and stuff, I came out of that experience realizing that like the those issues that I thought maybe were confined to, you know, the world that I grew up in, which is Southern Baptist. And I was raised during the satanic panic of the 80s where everything, you know, (laughs) is everything is guilty until proven innocent. Everything is satanic. Everything is evil. If it does not come from, and even within the bubble, like, you know, poor Amy Grant was crucified because she tried to make pop music rather than um, conforming to the expectations of the Christian music industry. And I I realized that not a lot has actually changed. It it seems like we've come a long way, but when you actually start to have 
conversations um, with, uh, <laughs> with other disciples of Jesus and look at the way that the industry continues to operate and talk to people who are, are, are well-meaning folks but aren't necessarily art lovers, their expectations of what is and isn't Christian art kind of is uh the needle hasn't moved very much from the satanic panic of the 80s the hysteria has changed a little bit the way that we talk about it's changed a little bit but we're still kind of in the same place and i realized that at the same uh at the same time that i was as a pastor now beginning to confront misconceptions about the bible and confront pervasive biblical illiteracy um, that it was all wrapped up in this conversation about art. So when I was doing the band thing and doing showbread, I was constantly, Chad remembers, I was constantly having to like answer these emails from Christian distributors about like, mm -hmm. we won't carry the CD unless you write out a little explanation of exactly what this song means and mm -hmm. just trying to absolutely drain anything of aesthetic value from, uh, <laughs> you know, a work of art. And and operating in that industry and then coming into, you know, pastoring a church and leading people and um, and them having questions about the Bible, legitimate questions about the Bible, but that spoke to a greater misunderstanding about creativity and the fact that, you know, to understand the Bible is to understand a work of art. And then when you start to talk to people about different genres of biblical literature and you talk about metaphor and poetry and wow over 30 percent of the bible is poetry and oh my gosh the majority of god's speech in the bible is depicted as poetry and people have this um jump that they make mentally where they where they think oh metaphor equals untrue or poetry sure. equals fantasy and rather than these no these are true things that the uh god is using through human authors to say things that are absolutely true about the world but he wants to do it through poetry or jesus wants to do it through a parable and some of those parables are violent and offensive and some of them are uplifting and redemptive and i realized that um if people had a wider a broader understanding of the way art works in general then they would have a much easier time understanding the Bible. They would have a much easier uh, time, or, or they would be less conflicted about some of the things in the Bible that uh, shouldn't really be that conflicting to the reader. And then other areas of the Bible that are, are meant to provoke you, that are meant to upset you, they'd be able to sit in that tension and appreciate it the same way that you can, you know, watch a complicated film and appreciate that you don't have all the answers or appreciate the tension in which the film leaves you. So it, it started in my, you know, the punk rock band phase of um, feeling a bit defensive, feeling like, why doesn't, why does it feel like I have to explain things that shouldn't, that don't need explaining or that are a bit insulting to have to explain? And then it grew up into, I hope, a more mature um, burden that I felt to help people understand the Bible. I think that, um, a devaluing of art is a kind of sounds really dramatic, but it's a kind of heresy because God mm. made art up. God is the original right. artist and he calls the readers of the scriptures into an artistic experience, not just an informative experience. Mm. And if we have no um, spiritual discipline of art appreciation, then we're going to miss a ton of the Bible. We're going to depreciate something that God made up that he not only asks us to participate in, but he, he actually requires us to appreciate art in order to engage with the scriptures at all. And in, in order to engage the things that he's made and the exp our experience of the world. I, so I think that that's something that's much more important than just, a, oh, I'm not an art, I'm not a film lover, or I'm not a creative person. So that stuff doesn't matter to me. I think that it, in mm. some sense, it has to matter to anyone who would follow Jesus. And yeah. we're missing something if it doesn't. Hmm. Yeah, um, so Josh, I'm, I'm really yeah, old, you, you know, I'm the really old guy on the, on the podcast. So <laughs> if I, if I fall over at some point and die, it's just natural, you know, to worry <laughs> about it. Um, but, uh, I, I started, my roots are in the punk scene in the eighties in Amsterdam. Uh, we didn't really do anything in any, uh, Christian venues or anything like that, but we were very straightforward, but you know, our, our, our art, our music was very confrontational. Like in Amsterdam, there's a big, you know, if you're, if you're walking down the street with your dog, people slow down because they don't want to hurt the dog. But if you're with a child, they won't slow down because they like dogs more than people. And so one of the songs that we did back in those days was, uh, 
Uh, the lyrics were, let the children die of infectious disease, protect the rights of the animals, please. And then we would take these, these uh, stuffed animals and throw them in the clubs, and then they'd throw them back at us. And it was kind of a, you know, people would see that song out of context, and they wouldn't understand that it was, uh, it was metaphor or it was, you know, ironic. Um, but then we got very, in our show, in the punk scene, we got very clear in our message, you know, where we had like, Jesus electrocuted on a mic stand cross and all kinds of crazy stuff that we did. And this is not in Christian venues in secular punk, you know, so I got spit on a lot and, and people threw a lot of beer bottles at us, but we saw God move powerfully because man, art is what a, it is one of the most effective tools at pre presenting Jesus to people. But in order to be good at that, I needed to know the punk scene. I needed to know their language and I needed to know what was going to confront them, you know, what was confrontational. And so um, what I've noticed, because then I, I <clears throat> went to some, some Christian festivals, not that many, but a, couple, a few Christian festivals in the U.S. And I was shocked at the lack of <clears throat> message that I saw in Christian bands, like no message. I mean, and I even thought to myself, why do they call themselves a Christian band even? I mean, if you're, if you're not going to have any message at all about Jesus or God anywhere in your show, then be a man about it and go play in a secular venue and don't, don't take advantage of this easy audience that you're, you're in front of. So my question is, can you as an artist not have Jesus somewhere in your message? Well, it depends on... This my personal answer anyway. It it depends on what you think is um, necessary to qualify as Jesus in the message. Sure. You know, C.S. Lewis had this famous bit about um, the you know the requirements for being a, a good Christian storyteller are the exact same requirements <laughs> for being any kind of storyteller. You tell right. a good story. Um, and, you know, there's this um, famous quote that I, I believe is falsely attributed to Martin Luther about, like, um, if you want to be uh, a shoemaker for God, then just make good shoes, you know. Um, so I think that uh, it depends. I, I remember this being a huge conversation in the uh, around the Christian music industry in early uh, 90s, tooth and nail era when... Um, a subculture of punk rock music was beginning to permeate um, not just the Christian music industry, but the punk scenes in cultural hubs around the country. So a place like Seattle was now having bands who espoused some kind of faith in some sense that were playing in clubs alongside these other bands who were espousing no faith in Jesus. And there was for the first time a kind of um, reputable Christian punk music. It didn't seem like it was contrived to, you know, steal an audience. It seemed like these are just bands that happen to love Jesus and they play punk music. And now for the first time, the Christian music industry is having to deal with the fact that we have um, these outsiders, these disruptors that are, they're independent and they, uh, they're not really playing by the rules that we're used to, but they, they have distribution now. So we have them in our bookstores and we're going, what are we going to do with this? And then at that time, there was a huge question, especially with the rising popularity of Christian punk bands about like, what is like, uh, what qualifies as Christian music and what doesn't? But the roots of it actually go a bit further back because well, I mentioned Amy Grant. This is twice now Amy Grant. In <laughs> yeah, yeah, man, we get the hint. Now, I love Amy Grant. Um, and her album Heart in Motion is still a fantastic record today if you go listen to it with headphones listen to that thing loud it's amazing um but uh to the point amy grant had made an album that did not sound derivative it, in fact it sounded comparable to what was happening on pop radio it sounded like a phil collins record um but you know like uh, it did not sound as if uh the way christian music has come to be understood which is about five years behind what's going on in the you know greater cultural areas a little bit derivative and not quite as good and then you get a you know something that's sanitized. But uh, Amy Grant had made a record, Heart in Motion, that was nominated for a Dove Award, I believe, 
and uh, had received the, this huge backlash because several songs on the album were not overtly Christian in the way that we're, we were accustomed to overtly Christian at the time. So there were a couple of mm -hmm. singles on the record. I believe one of them is the song Baby Baby, which sounds just like a pop love song. It's actually a song about her kids um, and how much she loved her children. And the outcry was like, this song is not about Jesus. It doesn't have, it doesn't mention Jesus by name. It doesn't say anything overtly Christian. It should not be nominated for a Dove Award. Um, to which the, you know, the rebuttal was that like, what in the world? Like, this is someone who has used their talents and abilities to write a song about something that um, is universal to the experience of most parents. Like, she loves her kids. She wrote a song about loving kids. There are entire passages of of the scriptures that are in the same vein. Um, all that to say, I think that the for an uh, a disciple of Jesus who is an artist, I think that there is an inevitability that Jesus will be a natural outworking of the things that they have mm. to say. How obvious that will be to everyone will differ from person to person based on you know the mm. audience. In the same way, David, that you're talking about, there were people who didn't realize that what you were we're doing was satire, um, even though it seems like even just hearing a brief retelling, it seems obvious to me and funny. Um, but there were people who divorced yeah. of its context, thought that you were actually endorsing the things that you were satirizing. <laughs> yeah, we um, were we were like in some newspapers. They said we were a satanic band. Yeah. That that song. <laughs> and hey, you're in good company. They said the same stuff about Amy Grant, you know. <laughs> yeah, well, me, yeah, three, yeah, absolutely, yeah. three times. <laughs> three times. That's so, man, I, I don't know. I'm, hey, Josh, I'm concerned, um, Josh, that you keep talking about Amy Grant. I don't know what to think about that. Unashamedly, yeah. I have no <laughs> guilty pleasures. It's fine to be an Amy Grant fan. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Come on, hey, Luke. Josh. Um, I had. <laughs> hey, my mom used to listen to Amy but Grant. Josh, okay. Josh, wait a minute, Grant. Josh, Luke is a rollerblader, so that would explain some of his. Right on. It yeah. Does. Heck yeah. It does. Yeah. It's like there I am a few years ago. It's <laughs> yeah. a file photo. Josh, I I um I agree with what you were just saying. I think that there's a lot more to when we I like how you, you put it that if if naturally as a follower of Jesus, it'll come out in whatever we're doing, um, and it'll come out in different ways. And I feel like there's a depth to what can be communicated through art that is missed. And maybe that's what you're looking at or addressing in the book. Um, and when you were talking before about the depth of art in the Bible, it was reminding me of um, when C.S. Lewis talks about the numinous and how we've lost that sense of awe or like we don't realize that there's this, there's this supernatural ability to um, be aware of God. God in in this way that just shocks us that just just hits us and if it's like modern man or like in our times like nothing shocks us anymore and people they don't get the mystery of God anymore and I feel like when you were talking about the role of art it feel I think that that's probably one of the key things that art should be doing for us in the kingdom of God is bringing back um, pointing to elements that are deeper than what's on the surface that bring back the shock and awe of who God really is and 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 what his love is for us or what 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 his character is like and all these things so and I've thought about this for a while but I've often struggled to know how that can come out practically like how can we um, portray in a way or, or allow our, our art as a church to go deeper and, you know, you've pointed it out. There's a lot, lot of stuff you get stuck in a box. But even the stuff that's kind of broken the box, sometimes I feel like we've just been able to step outside and do something that, that you know, mainstream was already doing. And we're like, oh, great, we can do it now as well. But yeah. there must be more than that. And I feel like we, maybe a few artists out there have done that, but very few have really... Um, gone further and, and I'm not sure if that's exactly where you go with the book but could you speak into that more what do you think about that is there something more we should be doing artistically in pointing to God and to and to you know to to our faith yeah I think that the first and foremost is to develop a robust appreciation for art in general I think that um, the and I don't mean to be um, overly simplistic I, I realize that there are a great many artists who follow jesus who are doing um doing their best to be uh groundbreaking and to you know uh not self-censor and th things like that but 
to for the sake of time, let me just be a bit overly simplistic. The bad reputation that Christian art has usually comes down to inauthenticity. It seems like um, my wife and I play this game. This is mean, but we play this game when we're traveling <laughs> and we flip through the radio stations and we try to name the Christian station before we hear any identifying lyrics. <laughs> so nice. just based on sound alone, can you name the Christian station? You know, click, click, click. And we win every time. <laughs> and it's because it sounds kind of lame. It sounds like not, it sounds insincere. It sounds derivative. And you're like, there it is. And then you wait a second. And then here come the, you know, uplifting um, emotional lyrics. It's the same way that, I don't know if you guys have ever sat in a movie theater where the trailers that, that preface the film, one of them will be like an independently funded Christian movie that had enough money oh, to yeah. distribute a trailer and, and, you know, and you're sitting there and the trailer starts and you're like, what the heck? is this why does it not look like a real movie like is this a, <laughs> is this an snl bit is this like a commercial is this a fake commercial and then it'll say from the producers of the last big christian movie and you're like oh there it is um and that's it's such a shame it's it it and it's a palpable sense that you can feel in the room people laughing that kind of thing and it, it's not always you know someone's fault it's not always because it's insincere but i think a lot of it has to do with these are products that are being manufactured by people who don't act they're not actually filmmakers and film lovers they're people who are trying to infiltrate an industry to you know share a message that's a to share a message is a good thing to be clear but i think that it does a certain level of disrespect to something that god cares for deeply god cares about art he cares about sincerity in art he cares about preserving a sense of authenticity even if that means that something is going to be provocative or shocking and I think that it does a deep disrespect to something that God cares about to be like, let's just figure out how to do it real fast so that we can, you know, package a message into this thing. A message is important, but I think sincerity is important as well. So the first step to me is developing a more robust appreciation for different kinds of art, which could come from all sorts of ways. It could just be like going through a list of like, the great literary works of our yeah. time, you know, pick up a John Steinbeck novel or some, something like that. Or it could be like visit an art museum and take like a, some time to actually look at things that don't seem like they mean much to you, but ask yourself questions about those things or, you know, listen to a record sitting quietly by yourself from start to finish and actually think about the things that you're hearing and how they interact with or contradict your own worldview, that kind of thing. And when you are steeped more in an artistic understanding of aesthetics and why people make the things they make, when you try to educate yourself on why art goes this way or that way, then you get into a place where your own creativity is, I think, less inhibited, where you, I, I mean, hmm. if I'm honest, the art that has most inspired me to make records or to write novels, um, a lot Amy of it Grant. come, Amy Grant is one of them, <laughs> four, a lot four. of it. It comes from, uh, you know, people who follow Jesus a lot, like Flannery O'Connor is, is a mm. writer of fiction who is a devout Catholic, loved Jesus deeply. Her prayer memoirs are beautiful. And she writes these really like uh, a shocking, upsetting, unsavory Southern Gothic novels that are incredible. They've inspired me. And, and her understanding of Jesus, I think, is palpable right there on the page. But it would never fly in a Christian bookstore or, you know, whatever is the equivalent. Now, I don't know how many Christian bookstores we have left these days, but it would never fly within that industry because it breaks all the rules um, for a Flannery O'Connor to get on the shelves in the 90s or the early 2000s. She would have had to sit before a distributor and saying, you can't use this word. You have to cut out the scene with this in it. And then now we've completely, uh, you know, censored one of the great literary voices of our time that continues to speak to not only disciples of Jesus, but people who don't even follow Jesus. Flannery O'Connor has one of the few um, reputations that uh, goes in and out of both conversations, whether you're a Christian who's trying to get up on, you know, like Christ famous Christian authors or someone who's just a, a fan of great literature. And it's because Flannery O'Connor you know, like actually cared about the art form. She cared about sincerity and authenticity. Right. And I'm not saying that unless you put crazy stuff in your work, you're, you're somehow being inauthentic or that if your work sounds like another Christian, that it's inauthentic. That's not the case at all. But I think um, in my own personal experience, when I have conversations with artists who are a bit frustrated and they feel like they're hitting a wall of limitation, 
question and I start to ask them about like, well, what's inspiring? What kind of art is inspiring you? It's usually like um, just other things in the immediate Christian vicinity of like corporate approved, comrade approved Christian art. And I'll say like, okay, well, I mean, like, how's your sensibility? Would this kind of thing offend you? Like, what if you tried this record? It seems like you like this kind of music. Here's one of what is widely accepted to be one of the great examples of that genre. And it's probably not, you know, the thing that you, you've been um, listening to. And, and then that might expand their, uh, their idea of aesthetics. And, but I, I also think that, you know, you have to go from person to person based on sensibilities and conviction, which is why I think that art, like any other, you know, like, like biblical interpretation, it's always worked out in the community of God's people with the conviction and discretion of the Holy Spirit, and of course submitted to the mm. teachings of Jesus in the scriptures. So it's not just like anything goes, you know, Josh says that he likes Nine Inch Nails, so anybody in the world just go put on the downward spiral and you'll be inspired by God. No, it's not like that at all. It has to be like, mm -hmm. well, what does it mean for us to engage with this kind of art? And you, you know, it's that's worked out in a community with other people who know you and ask questions and challenge you. And the conviction of the Holy Spirit, what God um, might put a certain limit on my sensibilities for a certain kind of art that might be quite different for the person who sits next to me. I don't think that it's all completely subjective, but I think that there is a level of subjectivity that we have to acknowledge and work out. But in that, learning to appreciate art in general is the first step in mm. overcoming the, you know, the mediocrity. Oh man, you! I feel like yeah. I about nine different questions came to mind every like two or three paragraphs, and so like I'm like, how am I going to morph this all together into some coherent sentence? You know, I, I think like you, the way you ended, I think is so appropriate because art, I think, has been devalued to mere entertainment, and then what happened in the Christian setting is parents got freaked out because they recognized that they weren't going to avoid their kids wanting entertainment, but they wanted al safe alternatives to the things that they were seeing. So it's like, you can't listen to Blink-182. We got to have Reliant K. You know, <laughs> if you're into the Foo Fighters, it's Skillet, right? Whatever, like whatever the Christian alternative is. And I'm not knocking any of those things. I'm just saying when art is just entertainment and then you couple that with shallow spiritual development, then you live in a very dangerous world where you better not surround yourself with dangerous entertainment and a superficial faith because then you're in real risk. And so I do think these topics kind of marry together. Um, so I, I think that that's a huge part of this. To, to address the elephant in the room, though, I, I think one thing you said that was so good was that this is worked out in community and, and with the guidance of the Holy Spirit. But the problem with art is that often the art is being put out far beyond the reaches of community. So the person across the world who's listening to what you're putting out is not in community with you. And, and often it feels that the, the, um, the sort of uh, moral boundaries maybe that are being pushed in the name of authenticity that could potentially be something that would, would weaken someone's faith are not done in the wrestling of brothers and sisters, but done thrown out there, often, as you say, divorced from context, can we, how do you wrestle with that? You know what I mean? Because you, you don't want to be the millstone, right? You don't want to hurt somebody's faith while being authentic. So how do we yeah. wrestle with that that weight or responsibility, I think, that is that is good for an artist to feel that, man, I am an influencer and I do want to be authentic, but I don't want to be a detriment to someone's faith at the same time without, of course, putting undue responsibility on one person for the, right. somebody else's faith. Sorry, that was a bit rambling, but... but no, no, I understand. And that's I think that that's a pressing question. Um, and I have two uncomfortable answers <laughs> to it. I think that, It's provoke um, and inspire. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the first is that to speak to the community thing a second time, um, it's easy to go to, like, uh, for, for example, Paul's argument about meat sacrificed to idols and context, you know, you have a letter in the New Testament, Paul's writing to a church where there's a debate um, that no longer has much to do with, uh, in the specific sense anyway, us anymore, in the sense that people are like, hey, are we allowed to eat this meat that got sacrificed to a pagan idol, but then they sell it in the market? Is that wrong? And Paul's answer to be, uh, to, you know, make the Bible scholars uh, that might hear this head spin, to be way simplistic about it, is that he's like, well, the act itself, is is not wrong in and of itself but you have to understand that there are people in your community that haven't you know worked that out yet their maturity is in a different place than yours your their conscience is different conscience is different than yours 
So you need to like, a, you know, show a radical concern for the people in your community whose maturity is in a different place. And if that means that you can't eat the meat, even though there's nothing wrong with it, then, you know, just don't eat it. And that's where you get the, the oft quoted, um, it, if, if it offends my brother to eat meat, I won't eat meat thing that, that I've heard historically applied to the conversation about, you know, art and how art offends certain sensibilities and, and the things that you make specifically and how you say them. Um, but I would, so I would put that into the community conversation, like in my immediate vicinity, um, when it has to do with the way that you talk about the things that you consume artistically or the things that you enjoy, the way that you recommend and share certain things, you have to demonstrate a concern for people whose sensibilities are quite different than yours who and whose um, maturity might be different than yours. Not, not to say that if you like things that are more offensive, it's because you're more mature, because that's certainly not always the case, but you need to demonstrate concern for, um, hmm. you know, the weaker person in that sense. The other thing that I would say to that though, so that that's an uncomfortable realization for a great many people that like, it's the, are you trying to say that it's not necessarily the wisest thing to jump on social media and be like, Oh, I saw episode this of this show. When you know that someone in your community, um, someone in your circle of influence would be like, wait, is that okay? I didn't know that was okay. And they're struggling with this mm -hmm. other thing. And now sure. they've been um, kind of set off by it. But the other thing is that the Bible itself, um, to say nothing of many, many specific scenarios within the biblical narrative, does demonstrate a certain um, willingness to provoke and to offend without explaining itself and without answering to the sensibilities of the reader or the people in the audience. So a great example is, you know, Jesus uh, who is this incendiary divisive personality he draws people to him and then he alienates people there's this great story one of my favorite jesus stories when he's going back and forth with the um the, the arguing over the destruction of the temple something that these people have no ideas about to have he's talking about his own body there's so much metaphor and and he suddenly says unless you eat my flesh and drink hmm. my blood I was reading that today then you can have no part and, yeah and and Jesus is not, it's not like he's um, not sharp. He understands at that point that his audience, this will be lost <laughs> on his audience <laughs> in that moment. And it costs him a tremendous amount of, of followers. The, it's that we read specifically that many people mm -hmm. left. And, um, and then when Jesus turns to his friends, the, 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 you know, the followers in his immediate vicinity, the disciples, he says, does this offend you? And then uh, are, are you going to leave as well? And you have this great answer from uh, Peter who doesn't say that he's not offended and doesn't say that he gets it. He's just like, well, where would we go? Like yeah. at this point, <laughs> we, you seem to know what you're talking about. So we're going to follow you, right. which I, I think personally seems to infer that he's like, that was nuts. But yeah. at this point, where <laughs> else are we going to go? We got nothing left. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. The, this is it for us. Um, yeah. And Jesus doesn't stop and say, okay, hey, listen, everybody, I didn't mean to offend anyone. Here's what I really meant by that. It was a metaphor. You'll understand it later. And that's not an isolated <laughs> incident. I mean, the Bible is filled with stories like that. Jesus does that kind of thing all the time, deliberately provokes people. In fact, um, he is asked point blank, why use parables when you know that not everyone will understand them? And Jesus says, that's the point. The point is that not everyone understands them and he has this really crazy cryptic sounded thing where he says like to the one who has even more will be given to the one who doesn't have even what they have will be taken from them which most scholars take to mean that he's saying if you're on the end and you're understanding the metaphors that i'm using it's going to speak to you in a profound way but if you're like no i don't get this i'm kind of standing on the outside being cynical and skeptical about everything he's saying then even the little bit of insight you have will be taken away so it seems like Jesus is willing to be confusing on purpose at times. It seems like he's willing to provoke at the expense of his um, audience. It seems like the Bible itself does that over and over again. You know, you get this crazy story about Ezekiel and the sign acts. He, he essentially does street theater where he does all kinds of crazy stuff, ties himself up and cooks mm -hmm. food over poop. And in the story, like God specifically says it won't work. Like the, no one's going to get it. It's going to be upsetting. You can imagine that dude like laying on the side of the street with ropes on himself. And like, it's not like they're, they're 
ancient context is so different from ours that that was normal. This was these were actually I've I've, I've done that, that in Amsterdam, so it I didn't work either. <laughs> it didn't work yeah, either. Did, yeah. The question is, did it work for you, or did it work any better for you? Yeah, David? actually, it did. It did work, but that's another conversation. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, and God doesn't say, "Hey, listen, we might offend somebody, so we need to actually consider." whether or not this will be misunderstood. It seems like it's kind of part of the part of the piece, the performance art. When God appears to people, he appears in these elaborate visions. You know, when he, um, the thing with Peter or his message to Peter about carrying the message of Jesus to the Gentiles comes in what would be to a uh, first century Jewish imagination, an offensive picture of these unclean animals that like, hey, eat these things. And he's like, no, I'm not going to eat these things. I'm not supposed to. Why wouldn't God just say, hey, Peter, it's time to carry the message on to the Gentiles. That would be clear, unoffensive. Right. Everyone would understand it. Um, and it would certainly have been easier, but God doesn't prefer that. He prefers to use art. He prefers to use vivid imagery. He certainly prefers symbolism all the time, all across the whole scriptures. Even the ancient traditions of um, ancient Israel are replete with symbolism, uh, in symbolism that's kind of gross and upsetting, sprinkling of blood and animal sacrifice, things like that, that themselves are symbolic gestures, speak to a deeper truth and a deeper reality, and God doesn't revoke the entire system just because it's going to offend the sensibilities of some or be misunderstood by anyone. So all that to say, I think that there's a tension between the two things. I think that the disciple of Jesus is called to be morally responsible, called to be wise and mature and discerning about the things that they say and the things that they share. That said, I think personally that a disciple of Jesus who is an artist and called by God to be an artist will inevitably be called to make and create things that are going to be misunderstood, misinterpreted, and, and likely offend the sensibilities of some. And that's part and parcel of the experience of being an artist. That's mm. the way God's art works. That's the way the creativity of Jesus works. That's the way the Bible itself works. So mm. it's within that understanding. That doesn't give us a, a, a license to operate with impunity and say and do whatever we want, whenever we want. We, we're morally responsible, discerning, and wise, led by the Holy Spirit in the community of God's people, understanding yeah. that it is inevitable that some will be offended and some will misunderstand. Yeah, you the thing you said about the parable resonating so much with some person then being lost on someone else. I remember we were playing a show and demonstrate the the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus in a really symbolic way, in a really powerful way. And I'm with this this girl and she's crying and she's praying to receive Jesus. And then the very next person I talked to comes up to me and says, Do you realize you were playing using satanic riffs? And I was like, Well, you don't win everybody. Uh, <laughs> yeah, case in point. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was like, what are you supposed to do with that? I didn't realize there's there's a pretty hey, uh, well established uh, key structure here, and I don't know, I don't know which hey, ones. Hey, Ben, but I'll can... avoid them. Ben, yes, I just got a text from Nigel. He said that uh, he loves loves you, Josh. He's your number one fan. Did you know this, Josh? About do you know who oh, Nigel is, Josh? Well, that's very nice of Nigel. Wow. Yeah. yeah, and he wants to know. I, 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 he just he just sent me a text, and he wants he wants me to ask you a question. Is it all right? Yeah, absolutely. Let's hear it. So he wants to know what you think of the uh, R L I U A initiative, and would you endorse that publicly in your church? The R L I U A initiative. I can't say I'm actually familiar with the. But, uh, but. It stands for Release Lions into Urban Areas real this is a real thing yeah he he <laughs> or this is what he thinks well i mean look at he that feels, banner i mean that's pretty real yeah so he, here's what he thinks he thinks that you know if people were out you know you're like out walking around and all of a sudden someone goes hey where's billy and then and then it's like oh a lion got him that would make it more interesting it would bring it would it would cause more tension when you're out it would cause people to ask the big questions uh you know, he feels like it could be a, a kind of the key to the new revival. Um, if, you know, to put, you know, lions in all the urban areas. Uh, so that's his, that's kind of his thing. Well, Nigel, um, <laughs> let me give you a really serious and uh, sobering answer here. I actually like animals a lot. You know, I'm a vegan. I don't eat the animals. I think we should probably show some concern for the lions as well. Um, 
Oh, okay. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, lions, yeah. lions weren't created by God to thrive in an urban environment. They actually wow. are uh, <laughs> native to certain parts of the world and not others. So I, I say let's let the lions stay where they can thrive as God intended. True, true. Although oh, depending on the urban area exactly. and depending on how well the lions do, they may actually reclaim that said urban area as their territory yeah, but but that's, that's true that's nor here that's nor true. there Josh, you know i've never been, I, that's that's the first time that's the first time nigel's gotten that kind of response you know you put like, nigel in his place and we're all a little grateful for that i, uh, I know so I, nigel, uh, I don't know he just Finally. hey josh josh i just got another text from oh, nigel and for the love all right <laughs> and he Mute. said that he said Mute. that. <laughs> all right hey josh this has been awesome uh we've <laughs> david is currently <laughs> muted i'm not sure if he realizes yet he will eventually <laughs> Uh, we've greatly appreciated your insight and wisdom into this, uh, I think a topic yeah. that, that can seem peripheral and that's part of the problem. And, and I love that you've brought it to the forefront, um, and, and for all that you've done to encourage this, um, when will this book come out and how can we get yeah, it when it does? <laughs> um, well, it, I was talking to, uh, publishers uh, around the time that the pandemic really oh. fired up. God. So the book release plans are kind of on uh, hold at the moment, but uh, as soon as things start to re return to some de some degree of normalcy, I I'm assuming those conversations will resume. But one way or the other, I mean, it's done. One way or the other, it's coming. Cool, cool. Mm -hmm. awesome. All right. Well, maybe if you're you know gracious enough to come back, maybe we'll have you on when it's out, and we can we can go deeper because I feel like there's so many even aspects of this conversation we didn't hit. So yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I yeah, thank you so much. Honestly, um, we're uh, we're grateful for your time, and uh, we're praying that God would use you in this season. And uh, hopefully, we can all all get back to actually meeting together. Because as fun as this is, uh, <laughs> I don't think this is how any of us want it to be. So agreed. Yeah. Thanks, thanks man. Guys, thanks for all having right. me. Yeah. Thanks, God bless. Josh, love you, bro. See yeah, ya, Josh. Thanks. All right. Well, there you have it. Uh, that was an awesome, awesome conversation. Wow. Yeah. That uh, man. One of my favorites. Yeah, yeah, sincerely, sincerely. I hope mm. we can have him back. Uh, we were mm -hmm. we were throwing texts back and forth. Should we do a random story? Why did Ben ban abandon the random story? <laughs> I don't even know. I just panicked. I David, saw him there. I was, and, uh, I, I was trying it, to get it. Was great. What's up it with was that? Great. We it have was this fresh. long. I don't think it was great, but it's like all of a sudden you just <laughs> I like think it was great. go off script. <laughs> no, it was the right move. I feel very, very fresh. good that it was the right move. All right, here's how we're going to end. Luke, before everyone abandons the podcast because yeah. Josh has left, hit us with the compact <laughs> school. Hit us with the numbers, why people should join. Boom, oh, go. guys, there's been a brilliant update today. We just, David told me before this that we hit 518 people Five, signed up eight, for the compact eight. school. That is brilliant. Yeah, we had brilliant. plans to use a Zoom room for 500, and now we're scrambling to use a Zoom room for 1,000 people because we think there's Luke, a bunch of Luke, people that still need to sign up. Stop saying Zoom room. What? <laughs> Sorry. No, I'm kidding. Uh, Streamyard. I mean, Streamyard. Uh, but uh, no, there's still room for you. So sign up. You go to steiger.org slash compact, and you'll find out that it's from May 29th to 31st, last weekend of May. It's also on the first weekend of June. It's the same school. It's just on two weekends. So you get to um, learn on one weekend, and then during the week, there's some breakout groups and uh, going deeper into stuff. And then uh, the weekend of the 5th to the 7th of June is the end of that school. So it's amazing because we usually do this in the cities where we have teams. And so we might have a few people there speaking. This time we're bringing in everybody who's part of our mission and who, you know, contributes with wisdom, experience and different ideas. You will enjoy it a ton. There's a lot of good content. So sign up today. Yeah, hit that big red button. Are running out quickly. Hit that button. Exactly. Hit that red, red button. Now. Come on, there Chad. Try to point at that red button. That'll help hey, the people. Hey, and don't don't forget the 3 Rs. <laughs> yeah, 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 people. All right. If you like this podcast, it will come out tomorrow about 24 hours from this very moment. Uh, you can search, well, Provoke and Inspire, obviously, on Google. Uh, you can search it on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, Spoozer, Dingus, Bananagrams. It's everywhere. Uh, also, the three R's, remember, rate, subscribe, and review. Uh, that helps us out. That increases the exposure of this podcast. <laughs> also, join the Provoke and Inspire podcast community page. Oh, yeah. What? I just said, oh, yes. Oh, oh, yes. <laughs>
Guys, that was fun. I'm a little tired for some reason. It feels like Friday. It's only Monday. Uh, but I love you guys very much. And we'll talk to you next time. Peace. Peace. Peace.